Rolling, brother. That was a good warm up. That was a great warm up. Uh, we we up. should have been recording for the last hour and a half. Yeah, I was just <laughs> warming up, man. <laughs> Lots of good stuff. Yeah. We got you in town. Uh, I first became a fan of yours from Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Well, thanks. Yeah, and just absolutely blown away. I became a fan of yours watching you punch people in the face. And getting punched in the face, too, yeah, I'm sure. Just yeah, as many. A little, a little bit. A little bit. We, won't, we don't have to talk about that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? the, hey, the, when I was a power lifter, I won every meet. Let's just say that. That's, that's good. Because it's not on tape, so nobody can see it. So. <laughs> yeah, there's no, nothing to go back to. I always lift it. They don't good. have them all on Fight Pass. Yeah, no. <laughs> every painful memory. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, and then, I mean, you... First, let's just start with what, and I'm, I'm sure you've answered this before on different podcasts. People know who you are. So I'm sure people tuning into this, you know, they're, they're going to be like, oh, why do you ask this question? Why do you ask that question if you've already answered it before? But I do like getting a little background. What got you into film, like in documentaries in general? Uh, it's interesting. We grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. We were from upstate New York. And every month, once a month, my dad would bring us to watch professional wrestling at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center. And it was the WWF at the time. And it was Vince McMahon's show. And, you know, uh, back in the day, if you saw uh, when the Hulkster was big and, you know, in, in the 80s, uh, they they used to shoot all the wrestling at the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, and we would go every month, and they would tape four shows there, and that sort of gave me this uh, I don't know this this gateway or this vision into something much bigger, like into there's something bigger out there, and like these giants come to our town like once a month, and we get to see them, and like hey maybe one day maybe we could do something like that, you know. And my brother wanted to be a wrestler, and I was always the biggest fan of my older brother Mad Dog, so. Him wanting to be a wrestler and, uh, you know, looking at entertainment as, as maybe a career. My parents never, they were nerds, so they never really thought that way. But I think this idea of wrestling, professional wrestling, gave us this, like, this idea to think and to dream big and to dream larger than life. And we were looking up to these guys like Andre the Giant, who was obviously larger than life. And uh, I think that that was the catalyst because uh, eventually I ended up going to work for Vince McMahon. And I worked uh, for WWE only for like about a year. No shit. Only about eight months, actually, back in 2004. I was a writer there for a little while. And when I went in to, for the interview, I had to do an interview with uh, Stephanie McMahon, with Vince's daughter. And she said, well, you know, why do you think you'd be good for this? And I just said, I, you guys taught me how to tell stories. I went to film school because of wrestling. Like, cause I learned from Vince how to tell stories, you know, how to, how to make a crowd react, how to, like they say in gladiator, win the crowd, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, we always kind of knew that through wrestling, like wrestling was a story. You get in the ring and you tell a story. So I, I think that was really the basis of why I got into movies and we just liked movies as kids and we worshiped Arnold Schwarzenegger and Hulk Hogan and Sylvester Stallone. And we wanted to be like them. And I was kind of fat and, and not in the best shape and didn't see myself necessarily in front of the camera. So maybe I could be behind the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was kind of hiding cause I didn't know how to not be fat, but you know, well, fuck man. I mean, you're, you're, every one of your films has been great. Some of them are hard to watch. I was just telling you that, uh, trophy kids was like a, a heartbreaker for my yeah. wife and I, you know, we have a little boy and like, you see these, you're about to get into that fucking dads <laughs> just drilling their kids on, running the perfect out pattern or the perfect, you know, you cut right here at the five yard line. You know, he's screaming in their face. Like just take like any fun you could possibly have out of being a kid and out of, out of playing sports. They, what the parents are doing. So trophy kids is a movie I did with Peter Berg. And the reason that I made that was my friend was a basketball coach at the time, my best friend, and he was kind of getting abused. And so one day I just took the camera over to his practice and I was watching all this insane stuff going on and he was actually on the phone with one of the moms and he's like let me just put it on a speakerphone let me show you how crazy this is and I was recording it and his mom's like well hell what are we gonna do I mean I gotta fatten him up for next year I mean he's gotta put on I gotta put like 10 to 15 pounds on him and the mother's just talking to this, about this kid like it's a cattle or something you know like it's some sort of farm animal I gotta put some weight on him I gotta fatten him up like she's fattening him up for the slaughter or something you know, she's <laughs> trying to get her kid bigger to, to play basketball at a better school and then I saw all these kids that were jockeying for position especially in Los Angeles they're jockeying for like what school they were gonna play for and where I grew up in upstate New York, you lived in Poughkeepsie, you went to the high school in Poughkeepsie, that was it. And like out here in LA, 
they would go uh modern day all these other big yeah, programs yeah. there's all these programs that are built up for years with you know almost like professional teams of coaches behind them and the the um barrier to entry has gotten a lot greater uh it's hard if your kid just started or if you just moved into that you know that city or whatever it's hard to get your kid into the programs you know it's hard to so the, the it's like really uh these parents are they I, I think they think it's a race to the top but what it really is, is a race to the bottom because what ends up happening is the parents that have all this money and are spent like so i'll give you a good example redondo union high school in los angeles they spent ninety million dollars, nine zero million dollars on their sports complex. They redid the football field, basketball courts. <laughs> what? That's fucking. That's like Arizona State. Yeah, yeah, no, they spent ninety million dollars, right? And this is all paid for by the taxpayers of the state of California, like of Redondo Beach, right? And they they put it in. It's, it's all for athletics for this one school. And so the school was pretty shitty in basketball when we showed them in uh, Trophy Kids. They they were like, you know, mediocre, right? So what they do is they the the parents band together in trophy kids and they get the coach fired. The coach had been there for 15 years. He developed some really good kids out of that program. Like I, when I say good kids, I don't mean good basketball players. I mean good people. And so he developed good people, but the parents that wasn't good enough for them. They needed to win. And because certain kids weren't getting playing time or whatever, they forced that coach out. And what they did was they hired a coach from uh, Loyola, which was a black school, basically, you know. Um, and they they hired this coach and he comes in and he brings some of his kids with him. Well, he brings in these three black kids that are from the inner city, right? So that right away, it causes racial problems. It causes like tension. And then guess who, guess who plays in the $90 million facility? All the kids that aren't from the town that raised the money that paid for it, the the coach isn't from there. The parent, you know, so it it just caused this big debacle. It's like, do you really do you want to win that bad so that your kids don't even get a chance to play and get on the court? You know, is like that is that what you're trying to do? And so, it's that's why I say it's a race to the bottom because these parents in the affluent school were trying to you know force the coach out so that their kids could play. They bring in a better coach, and the coach just brings in better players. You know, and that's yeah. that's the bottom line. The reality of it all is like there's always going to be somebody better than your kid. So you should just love your kid and let them do the best of their ability. You know, let yeah. them do what they can do to the best of their ability. And, you know, just realize that they're probably not going to be a professional athlete. And if your kid grows up to be a professional athlete, just consider yourself one of the luckiest people in the world. That's all. I think that's the way you got to look at it. Yeah. And there's there's something to be gained from, I mean, I think I, I, when you watch Trophy Kids, and I encourage everybody to, like, it's, it is hard to stomach. It's hard to watch. I think there's, you know, probably a bigger issue today with participation awards and sure. we're not going to keep score and you don't learn from competition. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but if you look at that, like, like take, for example, when I, I was a senior at ASU and we were just talking about coach house, who was my strength coach at ASU he's the strength coach for the Panthers. Now I set the bench my junior and senior year at Arizona state. Yeah. And I had been an all-star all the way up until then. And it fucking killed me, but Humbling. there was so many beautiful lessons in there. It was humbling. Mm -hmm. uh, I get to figure out really what it meant to be a role player, like how to make sure my teammates were getting a real look in practice, but not hurting anybody, you know? Um, and a number of ways like that I could contribute to the team without actually getting in the game more than a couple plays a game. And that was fuel for me to continue athletics, you know, in fighting, like big fuel for me. Yeah. So, but like, those are the things like, like that, that can be drive for somebody. That can be a spark for somebody. Like, like maybe you want that chip to be on their shoulder. Maybe that's a good thing long term, oh, yeah, you know, right? Look at all the people that are great in football nowadays. I mean, look at Tom Brady. Look at the things that he's overcome. And just look at the things that, that anybody that's good in sports has overcome to get there. They're usually not the person that was out in front. You know, the kid that was out in front he's smoking pot somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, that's what happens. It's like, I know in my high school, all the kids that were, they're really good athletes in high school. It's like, they don't have the drive. And I think the drive is what really in the end makes the athlete not necessarily like, you can have all the components in the world uh, physically, uh, but if you're not willing to put them together and, and utilize them, then nothing's going to ever happen, you know? Yeah. So let's, let's, uh, let's keep going through the, the, the filmography here. You get through, um, 
Which one was first? Prescription Thugs was after. Uh, well, we did bigger, stronger, bigger, faster. Stronger, faster was first. Was very first. Yeah, yeah but that then, was uh, the first thing. Then we did Trophy Kids. After, okay, and then, and um, then Prescription Thugs. And then I did Prescription Thugs while I was making Trophy Kids. Um, actually, right after Bigger, Stronger, Faster, I had a double hip replacement surgery. I had genetic arthritis. Um, have have had it ever since I was young. As far back as I remember when I played football in high school, I couldn't run with the team. Like I've never run a lap. In high school? Like I've never run a lap in my life. Damn. Like I can't, I can't run a mile. I can't run at all. Like if you were gonna run me over in the street, you're probably gonna run me over. Like if I have to run, like I, I run all fucked up. Like I can't, I can't run good. It's like something I got, now that I'm actually in kind of shape, I wanna start trying to figure out how to run, but ever since I was a kid, it was always broken. Like I can run, like I can sprint, but I can only run like 20 yards. And then it's like, things start going all over the place. And I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me from that point of view, but I've always needed my hips replaced ever since I was really young. You know, I just got it done at 35 years old. And, um, you know, along with that came a lot of prescription drugs and a lot of pain. And that's what brought me into making prescription thugs was I was uh, addicted to prescription drugs for like six years. Damn. Painkillers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had a lot of friends in college, uh, lost a couple to opiates, but then, you know, just started with Vicodin and Percocet, then you go to Oxycontin, then you're getting 80 meg or 160 meg Oxycontin yeah, from a, somebody that's terminally There's like Ill. a ladder and it yeah. starts out with, you know, Norco, Vicodin. Yep. You know, actually like it even started for me uh, lower down the list um, with some of like the, the lesser opiates, the tramadols and... Uh, Darvaset was was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, when I was filming Bigger, Stronger, Faster at this anti-aging convention. And I remember I had taken like two Darvasets and then I had taken like four. I'm like, man, my feet, like my legs are killing me. And it was before I had my hip surgery and my hips were killing and my feet were killing. Well, let me take two more of them. And I was up to like six Darvaset and Darvasets are like kind of weak. But all of a sudden I felt great. I'm like, oh my God, I feel great. And I started interviewing everybody and I started asking you know, all these different questions of people. I'm like, that was awesome. And right then was when the addiction began. I didn't know it, mm. but it yeah, was before. You, had the, you hit the euphoric threshold. Yeah, I hit that button. And I still remember hitting that button for the very first time. I remember how it felt. And I remember I was working and I was working in what I love to do, making movies. And I was asking people questions. And guess what? I was a lot better at it when I was high, but I didn't know I was high. So I didn't know, you know what was going on. So you just, you get into that as a cycle. And then you're like, oh, well, every time I interview somebody now I need pills. You know, and that's kind yeah. of what you make these associations. Every time I go to the gym, I need pills. Every time I go here, I need pills. And you just need pills, pills, pills. And then next thing you know, you're just dumping them down your throat like crazy. And then the doctor cuts you off and then you're buying them on the street and then you're buying them on Craigslist. And that's what I was doing. You know, it's, it just got Fuck. to be out of hand really fast. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I should say this because a lot of people – um, don't have things like this that can, that, that help them. And unfortunately mine happened to be two suicides, like back to back. So I had a neighbor that lived right across the street from me. And, um, I came home one day and found out that he blew his brains out because he couldn't get more Xanax that he was addicted to. And he blew his brains out. Well, then, uh, I was like, man, that's, made me really think about my own addiction and my problem. What if I can't get Vicodin? Like, am I going to blow my brains out? Well, I don't have a gun, so I'm not worried about that. You know, <laughs> But I, I was always trying to think, like, yeah. well, what, you know, what's going to happen to me? Well, maybe I'll take too many and I'll die or something, right? So then um, I was I was worried about it because I had a you know, friend that killed himself. And then two weeks later, the guy that I was getting my drugs from, he killed himself. And Damn. that's where I was getting my drugs from. So then I knew I had to quit. I was just like, there's no, and we had, we had already lost my older brother, Mad Dog, you know, and um, I was just like, man, like when I, when Mad Dog died um, and he died in sober living and mainly because of drugs and alcohol. And when, when he died, I just said, I'll never go out like that. Like, that's not a way to go out, like in a sober living home. And, you know, uh, just he was lonely and sad and depressed when he died and just thought that was so sad. And I was like, I'll never do that. And then there I was doing the same mm. exact thing, going down the same exact road that my brother was going down. And I think so many people go down that road, but they're left alone and they're left by themselves and they're left stranded. And that's why like on Instagram, I don't know if you saw me out there when, before we were in here, but for about an hour, I just was answering questions. All those questions I answered on Instagram, I probably answered over a hundred today already from the plane ride 
Um, and then, and then here, and they're all about addiction and they're all about, Hey man, I'm on opioids. I can't get off. My mom is on opioids. My friend is on benzodiazepines. My, you know, and it's just all these things. And I'm going like, well, it's like $60,000 or, you know, the rehab that I went to $60,000 a month. You I go to could, passages at Malibu. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I went to Cliff, Cliffside Malibu. Oh fuck. And, and, and luckily, uh, I got lucky. I didn't pay for it. Mm. So uh, what happened with me was just like the most unique. We I always say like, like I lead the most ridiculous and blessed life in the world. So because I make films, I was making a film about prescription drug abuse, and I relapsed on prescription drugs. And one of the guys I happened that had interviewed six months previous was the owner of Cliffside Malibu. Wow. And when he found out that I was in trouble. He's like, look, I know you're trying to do something good. Just get over here. And I'm like, but I swear I'm going to still finish the movie. He's like, I don't give a fuck about your movie. Get over here and get better. So I went over there and I got better. And as soon as I got better, I said, Richard, I really want to finish this movie. I owe it to the world to finish this movie. And he's like, then go finish your movie. And he let me leave rehab every day. So I would go to rehab. Um, so the, the first 30 days I was there, I was there full time. And then the second 60 days I was there, I got to work on my movie for half the day and half the day I was in rehab. I mean, like you don't really normally get to do that, but the guy from Cliffside Malibu, Richard Tate, who was the guy that stepped in and helped save my life, he knew what I was trying to do. He knew that the mission was bigger. And he yeah. said, you're going to get this done and you're going to stay sober and you're going to help a lot of people. And I just thought like, okay, well, that's, that's what I have to do then. And so for me, it's not a question. It's just what I do every day. It's like, just try to always help people, whether it's with their diet, whether it's with uh, something I can help them with, with addiction, whether it's their training or, or anything. I've just always been taught to give of yourself and it always come back to you. And so far it always has. Yeah, fuck yeah. It's worked That's kind of that, that Aubrey talks about that the law of reciprocity. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're always if you're always aiming to give 51% and receive 49, then there's there's always this ebb and flow of what you give out to the world is slightly higher than what you're receiving, but you're always you receiving know, because you're giving out so much. Look at it, you look at it, a lot of people ask us too, like you guys are stupid. Like uh, you know, when we were younger, we, you know, in our 20s, Mark was trying to be a pro wrestler and we met John Cena and we brought John Cena in and we we were the ones that were like, hey, you have to do this for a living. You'll be great. You'll be a great wrestler. And everybody always says, what do you get out of that? What did you what did he give you? And I'm like, he didn't give me anything. But when our brother passed away, he was the one that paid for the funeral. He was the one that came through when our family was in need. He was the one, you know, so like things do come back to you. And it's not, not always like what you get right now. It's like, don't worry about what you get. Worry about what you did for that person. Worry about how that makes you feel. Like what, when, when we got John into wrestling, how good does it feel to get one of your best friends into the grand grandest stage of all for wrestling. Like and that was become cool. one of the legends became, of the sport. Became one of the best, one yeah. of the best ever. And I'm sure you got those stories with fighters and different things that you've gotten started. Cause we all, we all do that. It's that's just what we do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. That's a good feeling for sure. I yeah. didn't realize that you guys got seen into wrestling. That's yeah, so well, we, I, I would say, wouldn't say we got him in. We we just let him in the right direction. Yeah. He was working at Gold's Gym, and this is something- He was bodybuilding beforehand, right? Yeah, well, he was trying to trying to bodybuild, and he wasn't <clears throat> really uh, particularly successful at it. He was doing okay, um, but, you know, when these guys are 260 pounds all muscle and, you know, you're, you're up against a completely different, you know, animal, and- um, so uh, he was doing okay with bodybuilding, but when he went into wrestling, it was just immediate. He just knew it. Like, I mean, he got in the ring and he bounced off the ropes twice. And I'm sure you've seen this with MMA where like some dude just gets in and like wrecks somebody. And you're like, how? Like, holy shit, you know? And John was kind of like that with wrestling, even though it's so-called fake. Uh, he just ran the ropes a couple times. It just looked natural. And he was kind of a bodybuilder. You're like, well, bodybuilders usually don't run good. And then he took a couple he's bumps. Yeah. Yeah, he's an athlete. Yeah, he's a and great he, athlete. And you could see that from, from day one. He had a athleticism and he had uh, the main thing with wrestling is you can talk. Talk. And mm -hmm. we always knew that he could talk. Yeah, know, from that's by one. far the biggest. My yeah. buddy uh, Daniel Pewter. I know he, Daniel. He, yeah. he, he got on the uh, tough enough. Tough enough. Yep. Yeah, he got the million dollar tough enough mm -hmm. and won that, but didn't have the gift of gab. He's a much better speaker now. He's doing a lot for. Uh, he does a lot of anti bullying uh -huh, stuff. Right? A lot of different stuff for kids. Yeah, after school programs, things like that. So he's he's doing well, but he he definitely didn't have the gift of gab. And that's interesting, a requirement like if he, now. If he had had it back then, he might have uh, he might have stuck around there oh, a little bit longer. Been, yeah, could have been. Yeah, could have been. 
still wrestling until this day. Yeah, you know, for sure. But, and and WWE too. Like once they lose the flavor for you, you're gone too. Mm -hmm. We've seen that a lot with with wrestling. It's like you know, one time somebody said this to me. I always remember it. Uh, Andrew Bernarski, who played Latimer in the program, said this to me because he was trying to be a wrestler once. And <laughs> Latimer is uh, right. ripping the chicks. Starting off. defense. Yeah. Starts, <laughs> place at the table. Right. <laughs> you were leading me on. So check this out. Off. Like, remember, I said I lead a weird, blessed crazy mm -hmm. life i used to go to wrestling um in anaheim with andrew bernarski who played latimer in the program and he'd wear his latimer jersey from the movie this oh, is like so 10, this is like 10 years post program and i <laughs> you know i went to usc and when i was at usc i was friends with all the football players and we must have saw the program while i was in school like 10 times in a row we would go like every night when it oh, was yeah. out in the movie theater i was playing at like little local university theater and we just go to watch the program watch latimer and um, then I became friends with him. And it was the first experience I ever had with weed was driving around LA with Latimer in my car, smoking weed like crazy. And he would just abuse the shit out of me. He'd like always <laughs> borrow 20 bucks. Like, you know what I mean? Like if you meet these people, it's like the first celebrity I ever met. First of all, the first celebrity I ever met was the Barbarian Brothers. The second was uh, Andrew Bernarski. And then we used to show up at these wrestling matches at like Anaheim, you know, Staples Center or whatever. And uh, we'd pull up. He'd go, just pull up to the back. Pull up to the back. I go, okay. And this guy's 6'5", 280 pounds. He's a big dude, you know? So we pull up to the back. He goes, wrestler's entrance. And they're like, oh, sir, right there. And we'd drive right down the ramp and we'd park and we'd get out. We'd be backstage. I'm like, how did you get us backstage? You know, he's like, ah, I just said wrestler's entrance. And like, because he was in the movies, he didn't give a shit. And he'd go back and he'd just start talking to the wrestlers. And they just thought he was supposed to be there. And, yeah, you know, that's, we, that, that's sort of how I got my way into the, into the um, back, you know, backstage at WWE. And that's how I ended up getting a job actually eventually, which is just really weird is just meeting people through going backstage all the time, meeting Shane McMahon and, and those people as well. So yeah, like I definitely have this crazy. <laughs> what did you do when you were at WWE? Did you do? I was like, a writer. Oh, you wrote yeah. like, like storylines for the wrestlers. Yeah. I was a no writer shit. for, for a little while. And, um, we, it was a, it was a weird job, you know? And, uh, what was cool about it was, uh, the very first day on the job, you know, I say in bigger, stronger, faster, right off the bat, that Hulk Hogan was my hero growing up. And I get in the limo and the Hulkster's in the limo. I'm like, oh shit, the Hulkster's in the limo. Next guy in the limo is Mean Gene. I'm like, I'm in the limo with Hulkster and Mean Gene. <laughs> and Gene, okay. then Vince pops in the limo. I'm like, holy shit, Vince is in the limo. I, I can't wait to like call my friends back home and tell them like, you guys aren't going to believe this. But I'm like in the limo with the Hulkster and blah, blah. You know, there was no social media back then. It was like, there's mm -hmm. no way to share that experience. No camera phone. Yep. No, nothing. There was yep. nothing. I didn't have a flip phone then. There was nothing. I don't even think I had a cell phone then, to tell you the truth. And so um, I get in the car and, you know, I'm like excited because we're in the back of this limo with, you know, Hulkster and Vince and Mean Gene. And uh, Mean Gene offers me a beer. He's like, here. And I, I just... I just took it, you know, and I'm I'm just sitting there with it. And then like Hulk Hogan grabs a beer, he pops it open. Mean Gene grabs a beer, uh, he pops it open and, and Vince doesn't grab one. I'm like, oh, Vince isn't going to drink. I'm not going to open this. I'm just, I'm working. You know, I'm thinking like I'm supposed to be working. Vince is like, Hulk Hogan gives you a beer and you're not going to drink it. And I'm like, uh, you're not drinking. He's like, I don't drink. I'm like, okay. And he's the boss. I'm like, oh shit, this is Vince. He's actually in good shape. And like, he probably doesn't drink. And Hulk's just having a beer and Mean Gene's having a beer. So I crack it open. And I start drinking it. And they're all staring at me. And I'm like, what are they staring at? Like, I put it down and they're all staring. And Vince is like, are you serious? Kind of thing. Like, you know, you're going to drink on the job. First day on the fucking job and you're going to drink, you know? And they were ribbing me. But I, that's what I learned that that's what they do when you're on the road. You know, it's like they fuck with you. And, uh, and so, yeah, that they got all got a really good laugh out of it. I was scared shitless for, you know, for a little while. But you know, working there was, um, it, it was difficult. It was a, it was a crazy high stress uh, environment. So, uh, which was really weird because I didn't, I didn't think it needed to be. But anytime you're dealing with like live television, it's always going to be hectic. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I would say it was. It wasn't like a hard job. It was a, it's a very hectic job. You know. There's always like madness going on and you had to put out a lot of fire. So it was an interesting. Yeah. Know, and you interesting got different thing. pro wrestlers jockeying for a push. You, you had know, all, like, man, you're going to tank my fucking career. Yeah, I can't lose again. You know what's hard is all the divas. Cause yeah. they, they would. Oh, I bet. The divas would like come slide up to you and be like, oh, hey. So they, they would really be 
extra flirty with the writers because they wanted to get it, you know, they want to get in the script. new angles. Yeah, but yep. I mean, it's crazy how crazy it was. Like, they're like, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about my character. And it's like, yeah, sure you do, you know? <laughs> so that was oh, a little, that's awesome. Yeah. So you had, you had, um, I mean, wh- at what point did you get turned on to Kratom? Because you get clean, you finish yeah. the film with prescription thugs, and then obviously, I mean, we have it right here for yeah for the people watching on YouTube, Faith. A Leaf of Faith on DVD. It's on uh, Netflix as well as the rest. Is yeah, sure. I should explain Kratom a little bit. So Kratom is a plant from Southeast Asia that a lot of people use instead of opioids. So they'll use that instead of the Vicodins, the Percocets, the Oxycontins, things like that. But people also just use it to feel good. It, it's something that just makes you feel better. Uh, like coffee, you know, have a good cup of coffee. Like, ah, I feel really good, you know. And it's, it's like coffee on steroids or something, I guess, is what I would say. It's like it's like coffee and then a little bit, a little bit extra, you know, kind of that little mental kick that makes you feel good or puts a smile on your face. And um, I got uh, familiar with Kratom when I was doing prescription uh, thugs, because when I was making prescription thugs, people were telling me, you heard about this Kratom stuff? You can use it to get off of opioids. Mm. And so I'm like, bullshit. Let me, you know, when I was, when I was trying to get off of opioids, I mean, it was brutal. I ended up in the emergency room twice. I was on Suboxone for over a year. You're only supposed to be on it for like two weeks. And the doctor had me on it for over, you know, over two years. And, um, when I tried to get off of it, I just, it would have these really crazy withdrawals. So if there was something that could get rid of that withdrawal that drove me to go to the emergency room, I wanted to know about it. And so um, I went to this smoke shop and I bought some Kratom and I took 10. I'm like, okay, get, you know, it came with, it was a package of 10. So I took five, I didn't feel anything. I took five more, I didn't feel anything. And I'm like, well, I'm not high. And I'm like, I guess it doesn't work. It's just, that's what I thought. And this is while I was doing prescription thugs. So like flash, flash forward a couple of years and somebody brought it up to me again. They said, hey, have you ever tried, you know, Kratom? And at, at this point I had already, I had just been on Joe Rogan actually. I was on Joe Rogan's podcast and I was telling everybody like, hey, I was on Rogan's podcast and I was talking about um, using Advil and Tylenol in in combination and how that actually, it, there's been a, there's a study out and actually Dr. Drew told me about this. There was this giant study that they did about pain medication and they found that Advil and Tylenol in combination was actually preferred to opioids for pain relief. It actually works better mm-hmm. for most patients for pain. And so I was going around telling, you know, telling everybody that, you know, and, and I, at the time I didn't know that Advil kills 16,000 people a year. So I'm telling everybody, I just take, just take the Advil. It's better for you. <laughs> yeah. Take the Advil and Tylenol. Right. And so they're both deadly, you know, opioids are killing people because of respiratory depression. Advil is killing people because it's knocking out their kidneys and Tylenol is killing people because it's knocking out their liver. So there's, you know, three different situations. Each drug has a deadly repercussion, right? And I'm thinking like, well, there's got to be something else. And then so some, when somebody brought Kratom up again, I was thinking like, well, is Kratom liver toxic? No. Is it kidney toxic? No. Does it cause respiratory depression? No. Does it work? Well, when I tried it, it didn't work. So let me try it again. So a friend of mine um, that was the one that was asking me if I ever tried it was a pro wrestler. He used to wrestle for WWE. His name's Horseshoe. He used to do 90, 90 pills a day. His name in WWE was Luther Reigns. And uh, WCW, he was, he was Horseshoe. And, uh, you know, Luther Reigns was like, hey, bro, you ever tried Kratom? And I'm like, you know, n- n- no. But, you know, you have those friends that have done so many drugs that if they tell you to do something, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I hey, got man, friends you, ever, like that. you ever try this? And you're, and you're like, no, I'm good. You know, like, <laughs> but then you have those friends where you're like, well, I'm kind of curious because this guy doesn't think anything works. You know, Horseshoe doesn't think anything works. I mean, he, he's anti everything and let, you know, unless it was cocaine or whatever, you know, he, he always says, he has this famous quote. He says, there's mountains in Peru missing from my cocaine habit. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of guy we're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, he's been, and so he's been sober though for years. He had a massive stroke and he was sober and this Kratom stuff was really helping him. He had a stroke so bad that they basically, you know, they, he went to Arizona state as well. Actually, they said, okay. you know, get like, look, they told the doctor, the, the doctor told um, his friends, get his mother here tonight. He's not going to make it through the night. So his mother flew in from like, you know, Detroit or whatever. And she got there and, you know, he made it and he actually made it. He's, he's still around today, still alive and kicking. And he, and he, uh, this Kratom was really helping him to see how it helped him, not only helped him uh, get through the pain 
and and everything that he was going because this is quite a while after the stroke, but he still had residual pain from the stroke. But just to see his uh, cognition increase and see him be more normal because he would talk really slow and drawn out, and then on kratom he just talks normal. Yeah, you know. So I'm like, holy shit, man! Like <clears throat> this actually could have some implications. There might be something, you know, to this. So um, one day I was working with my brother, Mark, and I was at his gym and we were filming all day and I was just exhausted. Everything ate. I was at just that dull, achy pain that won't go away. And, um, you know, we just need to like slip into the hot tub for a little while and just get rid of it, you know? And that's what I was thinking of doing. But I was like, man, uh, let me, you know, let me try this Kratom that they've been talking about, you know? So my buddy had given me some and I tried it that day. And I just remember 45 minutes later, all the pain being gone. And I remember um, jumping up and down, like to see if I can get my legs to hurt, like they just hurt. Like mm -hmm. They were just in pain. Like I, I know I was laying down for a while, but I mean, they were just in pain 45 minutes ago. I'm trying to like smash on my legs a little bit. I'm like, there's no pain here. Like, this is crazy. And so I'm like, go outside, I walk around a little, I'm like, you know, so I call Horsham. I'm like, dude, you have to come over. We need to talk about this Kratom shit because I have no idea what you, you know, what you guys gave me. And so uh, Horseshoe, he came over and he was with my friend Kelly and Kelly actually owns Urban Ice Organics, which is a Kratom company. Uh, and I was dumbfounded by it. And basically just, it took me about three months to get like fully acquainted with it. But after three months, I said, we have to make a documentary about this. So the world needs to know about this plant. This is yeah. something that everybody, everybody needs to know about because so many people are in pain and so many people are hurting and there's nothing that we can do to help them except for say, hey, take an Advil. And we know that that kills a lot of people. Uh, now that we have something that's natural and it's been shown to be pretty safe, all I'm really pushing for, the, the main thing I'm pushing for beyond people taking Kratom is to keep it legal so we can research it. Yeah, I think that's that's a big one. But also, you know, just like um, it wouldn't surprise me if there was neuroprotective qualities to it. You know, like that's sure. something, um, you know, it, it just popped into my head as you were talking about uh, Horseshoe's stroke and how he had slowed down. And then on Kratom, he'd speak at a normal pace again. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of research into THC helping with cognitive function and helping heal the brain by clearing out amyloid plaque. So with, a lot with, of the things about THC that they're finding out are actually like opposite of what they thought too. Yeah, like they, completely. I remember um, I was just watching this report. I'm getting into CBD a lot mm -hmm. lately into really researching that. Um, what, what I'm seeing is a, a really clear path for myself. I was just talking to you about it, said I want to write a book about it. Uh, I think pain is destroying our country. I think when people are in pain, they can't function optimally. And that's what we talk about is optimizing human performance. And how do you optimize human performance? You got to take people out of pain first. That's got to be your first thing that you do. And so I have all these like techniques and things that I've tried, uh, like CBD oil, like Mariva curcumin, like all these things that will lower inflammation and kill pain. And Kratom fits, you know, really nicely into that. And I just, for me, can see myself carving a path of just like helping people get through pain with natural methods, not by, uh, you know, we, I, I smashed the shit out of myself trying to get out of pain, you know, and uh, I just, I ended up a wreck. You know, and now yeah. through all the steps that I'm taking to uh, feel better, I just feel immensely better than I did a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Kratom's cool too, because there's no like real draw for me. You know, like I'm, I took one today. I like it because it's a mild stimulant that's not racy the way like too much caffeine is. Uh, but it's nootropic. It turns me on and it's also mildly euphoric. Like yeah. it's great on road trips or long travel. It's mildly euphoric. And, and I also should say, because I'm kind of the guy telling people to take it, you have to be careful with it too. Because I, like yesterday I worked out, uh, I got up at, I did a 4 a.m. workout and I got up and I did an hour on the step mill. And in order to do an hour on the step mill, you got to be fired up, like especially four in the morning. So I had my uh, Terminator soundtrack cranking with my beats on and I had, and I took like six Kratom. And so I did that. And then I went home and I forgot that I'd taken six Kratom, you know, and done a whole hour workout. And by the time I took a shower and felt good again and was going to go back and train legs, I took six more. <laughs> and it was just too much. Like I, the yeah. whole day I felt like, uh, you know, I didn't actually, you didn't feel that bad, which is nice to know that you don't, there's not really that bad of repercussions. Uh, I just felt a little racy, you know? Yeah. And so I, I always tell people like, be careful with it and, and take it. Um, 
and take it and play around with the doses. Cause people like they, they want to hit me up on Instagram and go, how many do I take? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like if you're not sensitive to stuff and, and that's the problem with like a lot of the stuff with the FDA and the dosings and the, and the things like that is like, if you're everybody, it's, it's gotta be subject subjective because we're all different. And so like, for me to say like me ingesting this much of a plant versus you ingesting that much of a plant, there's, there's obviously a difference there in our size and our weight and the, the things that are carried in our blood, et cetera. And, um, that's why it's hard to tell people like how much to take. And I say, well, with Kratom, you got to kind of mess around with the doses. And I think I heard you actually talking to somebody about that just before with supplements. You got to play around with the doses, no matter what supplement it is. Yeah, that was just in the cafe. Yeah. Uh, just talking about that with, with Alpha Brains. A lot of people like Alpha the, Brain, yeah. That's the, what it was, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people, the, the recommended dose is two capsules. I took two before and, and liked it all right, but I didn't see what the fuss was about. And heard Rogan talking about taking four because he sweats a lot and he's a bigger dude and has good muscle size. And I was like, all right, let me try four. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah. All right, there, there, there we go. And that's I think the that's I, want. I think that's the thing. It's really easy to discount something uh, if it didn't hit you, you know. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will take kratom, be like, oh, I took kratom, nothing happened. And I like, take more of it, like try more, you know, like let's go. And uh, I did that with uh, Dave Asprey from Bulletproof. I gave him, gave him some credit. He's like, I, I didn't feel anything. I'm like, well, take more. He's like, you're the you're the biohacker, not me. Like, you yeah. know what to do, you know. And uh, I don't know if he ever felt it or not. I don't know if he ended up liking it or not. But that's the beauty of like these supplements and these things is like uh, we have so many people in this kind of space that we're gonna find all these neat little herbs and neat little things. And I've actually been finding things that have made a comeback. For me, for example, my shoulder, my rotator cuff is completely bro uh, blown out on my left side and uh, it's 70% torn and nothing can fix it. Like Kratom, nothing I've been taking was, was helping it. Kratom would help a little bit because it low, you know, lowers the inflammation. I'm rubbing CBD right into it. Nothing's working. And I went to the health food store the other day and I saw this DMSO. And it's a solvent that they use for horses. You know, yep. they've used it on horses for years for arthritis and stuff. I rubbed that DMSO on my shoulder and next thing you know, I'm like lifting my arm up and go, wait, it. I used to have to throw my arm in the air to get it to go up. Now I can lift it up without that pain. And then I, you They know, sell that in a store? They sell I it thought in a you used to have to special order that. It's weird. I, it's in some weird health food store. I found it, right? And so, I'm, so I wrote that. And then I remember it's a transdermal also. So mm -hmm. it'll, it'll actually take those, whatever you put in with it and drive it right in your muscles. So I was mixing DMSO, Kratom, Mariva Curcumin, which is the only kind that our bodies will absorb. And, um, and along with that, using CBD oil, like right on the joint itself. And I, my shoulder hasn't felt better in like a year, you know, and it's just a combination of all these things. Plus probably some sort of placebo effect. Cause I think I'm a mad scientist and that probably <laughs> helped a little bit too, but Hey, a placebo effect can work up to 16%. So I'll take whatever I can get no matter where I'm getting it from. You know? Yeah. Well, and then all the other factors, you know, we were talking about kind of what does that roadmap look like to wellness? Yeah. And it's it's really about all the things. And it doesn't have to be, if it's too daunting to say, I got to figure out how to move and diet. I got to figure out how to sleep. I got to figure out all these practices. Like, well, just fucking take it piece by piece. And over time, over the long game. I think um, we talked about that. it in the car on the way from the airport. It's one step at a time. We talked about sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get plenty of sleep and I, I get plenty of sleep. My sleep sucked in the beginning. So you said, well, how you sleep? And I go, well, great now, but it was really crappy. And then, uh, and I think if you talk to guys like Jesse Burdick and those guys, and you're trying to lift the most amount of weight, that's what my brother would always say. He said, you don't sleep enough. And Jesse would tell me, Stan Efferding would tell me, all of our friends are like, you don't sleep enough. You're always kind of burnt. You know, I see what time you post on Instagram. You're not, <laughs> you know, you're not sleeping enough. And so, um, you know, you get found out and then, you know, you get in trouble. And then, but you really realize when you take a step back and you actually just focus on sleeping and you say, I'm going to do myself a favor. And at nine o'clock, the lights are going to go off and I'm going to go to bed. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to forget about everything at 9 p.m. or whatever, or 10 p.m., whatever time it is. That, you know, usually it's one o'clock in the morning or whatever. So, when you shut down early and you get out of bed or, you know, you, you get to bed early and you make a, make it a plan, it just becomes such a different thing. And then you start, once you get your sleep in order, you're like, oh, well now I'm not tired. Now I can actually optimally do these other things in my life. Yeah, right? And, and so it's I think weirdo, sleep, it snowballs into all avenues, right? Like with the hormone levels, ghrelin and leptin affected by sleep, absolutely. how your appetite has changed throughout the day, positively or negatively. Well, and you know how they say we're connected from like our heads to our toes. And like, as I'm getting, you know, massage work done and things done to like help heal my body and fix my body, 
I'm like, well, there's something wrong with my feet. My feet have always been messed up. And so I went out and I, I threw out all my sneakers that I had. I had all these Nike Air Maxes and they were just squishing my feet in. So I went and bought some Metcons, which were a little bit wider. I bought some Hoka uh, walking. Yeah, those are really good. Walking sneakers. They let my feet um, sit a little bit more splayed out like, they, like mm -hmm. they're supposed to be. And I bought these things called yoga toes or awesome toes. And they're like, they're toe those spreaders. The spread the toes yeah, out, they right? Spread your, yeah, they spread your toes out. And I put those on at night and I just keep them on. And they just keep, my toes are so hammered and gnarled together like this, that if you walk around like this all day, you're going to feel like that, right? Mm -hmm. so when I, my feet are like this, I'm like, oh, I, my feet actually feel relaxed. When I'm walking now, it's weird. I'll be, I was just walking through the airport and like stumble every once in a while because I'm not used to, like my feet are, have been so out of whack for so long that now my feet are, are working right. Sometimes I'll misstep even because mm. my, I'm not even aware that my feet are, because like, they're working correctly and that, that I'm not used to that, you know? Yeah. So that's sometimes weird. But yeah, like you said, it's a snowball effect and you fix every little thing as you go along. And then you start, I, I tell people that about their diet too. It's like when you start your, your diet, don't just go all in. Don't go in and like rip everything out of your house and throw it in the garbage. Just start throwing things out, you know? Start getting rid of the garbage, you know, and start get, getting it out garbage, of your Garbage, I yeah. love that. Yeah, yeah, get it out of your house, you know? Yeah. But just start, just do things slowly. Don't, you don't have to do everything at once. And I, I've always found that like when you do everything at once, uh, it comes back to you all at once, you know? So if, if I throw out everything in my house at once, I'm going to end up binging and going in Costco and buying, you know, the giant bag of Oreos, you know, that's the opposite of throwing everything out. And so that's just, for me, the way I, I tend to do things. So like, um, the past two years I've been working on losing weight, which just sounds crazy for most people. The past two years I've been working on losing weight. Like even saying that and coming out of my mouth sounds like, well, you must not be successful. And like, no, actually I've been the most successful I've ever been because I've taken two years to do it. You know, yeah. not, I haven't taken 30 days to do it. You're not going to get, if you get there in 30 days, you'll lose it in less than 30 days. And that's the way I look at it. So I'm just trying to take a nice, even approach to get there. Hell yeah. And that's kind of the topic. I mean, weight loss is, I could say maybe one factor of it, but what diet, how, what diets impact is on our bodies? What is the title of your new documentary? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, right now, Mark and I are working with a tentative title of The War on Carbs. And The War on Carbs, it gets a lot of people mad. I think inflammatory titles are necessary sometimes because it'll make people watch it. So, mm -hmm. like, sometimes you'll go, like, War on Carbs, like, carbs aren't bad. And my okay, cool. Then it'll make you watch it, right? Because you'll want to watch it and tell me off. But then when you actually see what we're talking about, you know, I think that if you really look at it, uh, obesity is a scourge. We have five scourges of society, right? That is five scourges of health. We have obesity, and obesity leads to things like cancer, diabetes. it leads to diabetes, it leads to cognitive decline and it leads to heart disease. And those are the five scourges of health. Those are the things that we can avoid. Over half the people in the United States are in the hospital because of metabolic disease. If you were to remove carbohydrate from the diet completely, uh, those things I don't believe would exist in the way that they do now, right? Now that might sound crazy for most people. We're not gonna remove the carbohydrates from the diet. Don't, <laughs> don't think I'm trying to do that and trying to say that we should do that for everybody. But I'm saying that we have a massive amount of people in this country that are not carb tolerant. They're what we call insulin resistant, which means insulin, which is the fat storage hormone doesn't, or the storage hormone in general, doesn't work for a lot of people. So if it doesn't work for you, removing carbohydrates is a very simple step to get you out of it. And so uh, what, what Mark and I mean by a oh, war on carbs is like, hey, look, we, we launched a war on carbs. Like, I'm not going to eat any carbs for a while. And then by doing that, it just gets you in a mindset. You know, it gets you in this mindset to be a soldier in the war on carbs. And, you know, I, I got to do good things. And actually by doing this carbohydrate, like this low carbohydrate diet, what it led me to was a no carbohydrate diet, which I actually thought was really crazy. So when I was doing a low carb diet, I'm like, well, how much lower could you go? And somebody said, well, you could just eat meat. And that would be like no carbs. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I heard that there was these like zero carbs Zen people on um, – on Facebook. And then of course in gold's gym, things just start floating around. And I, I hear that there's some crazy guy on Joe Rogan's podcast yesterday talking about just eating meat. 
And I'm like, well, that's not that crazy. I used to do that 20 years ago. And I was explaining to you before that um, back in 1994, I went to Gold's Gym Venice for the very first time. And I started training there. And I was training with guys like Mike O'Hearn. And there was this guy there named Ron Fedko. And Ron Fedko was a power lifter. And I said to him, you know, he said to me, uh, you need to lose weight if you're going to be a good power lifter. You're just too fat. Like I was about 240 pounds. And I said, well, I don't know how to lose weight. I'm not really, you know. I'm good at lifting weight. I'm not good at losing weight. And he said, well, you got to stop eating carbs. And uh, I'm like, well, what do I do? I, what do I even eat? He goes, go get a, go get a piece of paper and a, and a pen and write this down. So I like run over to the front desk. Like I'm 23 years old. I'm all excited. I, mean, I Not even that. I was like 19, I think. Cause I was just, a, I just got to USC. This is before I graduated. So I, w I went over, I grab a, a pen and piece of paper and he just says, okay, red meat, water. And I write down red meat. I write down water okay, what else? I'm like, he's like, that's it. Red meat and water. I'm like, wait a second, red meat and water. That's, that's all you had me write down. He goes, yeah, that's, that's your diet for the next two weeks. That's all I want you to eat. I'm like, but what about pasta? What about, no, <laughs> what no. about my whole grains? It's not. Uh, <laughs> he's like, do you see that piece of paper? Do you see what it says? Red meat and water. That's what I want you to eat. And I did that. And I won my next powerlifting competition. I, uh, I didn't know at the time that red meat has all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that we need to sustain life. And I'm not saying that it's for everybody. It's just what I, what I did. Um, it allowed me to lose a lot of weight because I wasn't uh, constantly, I didn't have constantly elevated insulin levels anymore. I lost a lot of weight, but then I abandoned doing it for a while. Uh, for And by a while, I mean like 20 years I abandoned doing it uh, <laughs> because there was really no proof that it worked, you know? Yeah, that was way ahead of the curve. And Mark and I were always following keto diets. We were fans of Dan Duchesne, who was like the steroid guru back in the day, wrote uh, the book Body Opus, which was like a really low carb diet. And we, we would read all that stuff and we were very, very uh, into it, but there was no real medical proof. Now, if you go to something like KetoCon or you go to Low Carb USA, there's, you know, 40, 50 people speaking on low carb diets and all the, the benefits of them. And I think that we're going to see, I, I think that that's where nutrition is just moving. I don't see it going in any other direction. I don't see anything else that's even hot in nutrition now, or even really talked about like keto is, you know, and a lot of times it's like, it's overkill because we're in that space. I kind of almost hate hearing keto, keto, keto. You're like, ah, you know, you kind of want to just jump out of it sometimes. Um, but it's what works, you know, it's, it's seem it's been seeming to work it for, works a lot for of so many people. It doesn't work for everybody, but that's what we're talking about. Like we're not talking about, we're talking about the obesity epidemic. So like, let's talk about how a keto diet works for the people that are trapped in the obesity epidemic. Like if 66% are overweight or obese, that means that's a large percentage of it. So we're not worried about the people that aren't. I'm not, I am not concerned with the people that aren't obese. I'm not concerned with the people that are healthy on a vegan diet. If you're healthy on a vegan diet and you're happy, God bless you. Like, I'm not concerned about you. I think you'll be fine. You know, what I'm concerned about are the little kids who have no guidance. They have no nutritional guidance. They have nobody to look up to. They have nobody giving them answers. And that's what we need to fight for is these kids, you know, because look at what happens. Like, if you look, the, the saddest thing that I see is that the disregarded food in this country, the food that is the lowest uh, lowest on the totem pole, the food that nobody gives a shit about is in the school cafeterias. And that's a problem. These yeah. are growing kids. These are kids that are that are growing and we're feeding them pizza. I mean- And that, it's like the worst fucking why pizza are we feeding, on earth. But why are we feeding our kids pizza? Like that's egregious to me. You know, and people might, oh, you're crazy. Like a- what do you mean you're not going to give the kid pizza? You're probably not going to give him Oreos either. Like, no, I'm not going to give him pizza. I get into fights with my family and I'm all not the fucking give time Oreos. on the holidays. And if, you know, yeah. it's, they, they, they want to listen, man, there is, nothing, there is nothing worse than going through high school and being fat. I did it. I can tell you there's, there's nothing, there's no worse feeling than being left out because you're fat because you're, you're the chubby kid, you know? And my brother, my older brother suffered through it more than I did because he was fatter than I was, but I always was affected by my weight. Always. It always bothered me inside. It always made me feel less than everybody else because I couldn't control my weight. And, you know, I don't know, people might challenge me on that. They go, oh, you always look like you were in shape. And I, well, because I was trying real, real hard, but I mean, like I devoted my entire life to trying to be in shape and I wasn't in shape. Now the things I'm doing are actually very easy and I'm getting in better shape than I've ever gotten into. 
And that's what's confusing to me is like, wait, wait a second. All I did was like flip the script on the knowledge a little bit. That's all I did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's odd how you can make a dietary change that impacts not only your fat loss and your weight loss, but cognitive function, sleep performance, uh, aerobic capacity. Like I, I, when I'm in keto half the year and then I do like carbohydrate backloading on the other half the year. Um, but especially in that six months keto in the winter months, like there's just a different level of fitness. My resting heart rate's lower. You know, I'm in the high 30s, low 40s right now. And you just, there's like something, it's feelable, you know, it's yeah. palpable. It's not like that, oh, I don't know if it's working. It's like, no, you fucking feel different. And why do you do the different um, diets? You like just switching it up? I think ancestrally, it would make sense for us to cut carbs uh, when they weren't seasonally available, like pre-refrigeration, pre-shipping, you know, where you can get bananas from Panama year round, shit like that, berries from Mexico year round. It's like, if it's not seasonally available to me and I have family that's, my, my genetics come from closer to the poles and Northern, Northern European ancestry. Like, yeah, there was a period of time yeah. every fucking year where my family didn't have access to carbohydrates, yeah. period. So like, I'm gonna at least take that long. And then in the summer months, and there's some research from Dr. Sachin Panda that shows we can tolerate carbohydrates a little bit better in the summer months when they're more seasonally available. Um, I don't mind playing around with some carb backloading and things like that, taking up training intensity, yeah. getting more glycolytic workouts and just kinda, just a shift. Yeah. It's really just to break up the monotony you yeah, know, it's I not, it's okay. not necessarily because I think one way is healthier than the other. Well, I just like, like I was talking about switch. before I said war on carbs. Right. And then I was just talking to you before we got on here and I said like, you know, I'm going to switch to something else after I get to be as lean as I feel like I want to be. And, um, that switching to something else would be like adding in a sweet potato or adding, mm -hmm. in, you know, these foods that we know aren't going to insult the body and make us fat again, or make us go back to where, uh, where we were. And I, I think there are a lot of foods like that. I think Stan Efferding's vertical diet is amazing. I don't know if you ever looked at that. Yeah. Uh, Jesse Burdick was telling me about it. So Stan incorporates a lot of the same principles that are on keto. Like I say this, I say, why take a multivitamin when it's made of all this synthetic shit? When we know that a piece of steak, a four ounce piece of steak has all the vitamins minerals and nutrients that you pretty much need right just eat a little piece of steak a day you know instead of instead of your uh, multivitamin get your whole nutrients and then stan really has things like that in the vertical diet like you have you'll have some red meat every day but you'll have some rice with it and you'll have some maybe some sweet potato and you'll have some uh some fruit you know and some vegetables and stuff as well um, you know, because you're also trying to add muscle mass and we know that like glucose can help with that a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be, uh, you know, saying a war on carbs isn't to be like an idiot and be like, there's no value in carbohydrates. It's just saying to all the people that have no idea, like, oh, it's carbs. You know, like it's, it's like, it seems so obvious to us, yeah, but it's obviously not until we don't have, until people say, oh, fat people, that's still a thing. Like, I didn't know that was still a thing. Until we get to that point, then we need to have a war on carbs. Yeah. It's bottom line. Yeah. There needs, definitely needs to be a shift in education when it comes to that. Like, what's causing this? Most people haven't spent, I mean, in my first 34 years, no, 30, 32 years of life, I had never gone a day without carbohydrates and I'd probably never gone five hours without carbohydrates during my waking time. Wow. Right? Yeah. In fucking 32 years. That's crazy. Think about that. But that's why you're so right? accustomed to it. And that's why yeah. it's so weird. And that's why people, even professional athletes, endurance runners, Dr. Tim Noakes talks about that. A lot of them become pre-diabetic. A lot of them get fucked over time because, you know, as you age, your body doesn't deal with shit in the same way anymore. And you're slamming all these goos and energy packs. I just want to say one, one thing to our, our keto community. And this is like, you know, kudos to the keto community. It's like almost everybody in the keto community has come to the keto community because why? Because the system's broken. The system that they're using is broken. The system that the FDA and the people that want us to eat certain foods have put in place is completely broken and backwards. And so people come into the keto community and they're always people that were like metabolically damaged, had a disease, 
had some sort of, um, you know, a mental illness or mental problem that they were able to fix, some physical ailment that they were able to fix, some uh, autoimmune disease that they were able to fix. And so when you look at the community of uh, keto, a lot of these people, like you were saying, they, they've they tried everything else. They've mm -hmm. already tried it. And the reason why they're, they've landed here now is like their last resort and their last resort seems to be working. So what do they do? They change their entire life going from a, uh, you know, they'll be like an engineer. You look at these guys, like Dave Feldman. He's an engineer and he's like an expert in cholesterol now because he had a cholesterol problem. But mm -hmm. they, you know, they're really smart people who take their knowledge and apply it to something else. And, and now like the keto community is just full of people when you go around and you ask people what they actually do. It's really weird because they're not doctors and, you know, the normal scientists. They're from all, all walks of life that are just getting involved in the ketogenic community. They're fighters and filmmakers and people like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's seeing the benefits. Yeah. It's it seems to be pretty cool. Like to me, I, you know, when I wanted to make this movie about five years ago, you know, I wasn't even doing keto. I'm like, there needs to be a keto movie. Like somebody needs to do it. <laughs> and there's been a couple of things that have like, sort of like hinted at that. And uh, there's this movie that I think is pretty good called The Magic Pill mm -hmm. that really exemplifies a lot of it. I think the barrier there is it's an Australian film. And so that's just a little hard for our American audiences to really swallow and grab hold of. Um, I know it was, for, you know, I, I'm just speaking from my own experience. It's hard for me to grab hold of things that aren't happening, you know, here. Yeah. So hopefully like Mark and I can bring some atten more attention, like what's going on here. And also we'll bring a lot of like fun and flavor to it. It'll be hilarious. It'll be fun. Like there'll be a lot of ridiculous shit in there, but like, we're going to, we're going to tell a story by entertaining you and leaving, you know, I want, I want people, I want people to really think about what they put in their face every single day because it's one thing that we aren't cognizant of. We, we know everything the president tweeted. We know everything that he said, right? We know, it's like we, know, we have access to countless bits of information on our cell phones. We know what everybody posted on Instagram, but we don't even know what we put in here yesterday. You know, it's like, that's, that's bad. When you ask somebody, what would you eat yesterday? And like, I can't even remember. It's like, you can't. You know, I, I remember because it's beef, beef, and beef. But, you know, that that's the thing is like we, people just, they're not thinking so they don't remember. Yeah. You know, and if you think, uh, if I ask you, you, you could tell me what you ate yesterday because you'll think about it. You'll think about it for a minute. You'll go, okay, I had for, you know, you'll you'll know if you think, put a little thought in it. A but, big ass salad with oh. cruciferous veggies steamed and uh, some free range chicken breast with uh, some of Mark Sisson's primal, primal kitchen Caesar dressing loaded on top and probably two avocados mixed in. It's perfect. Yeah, incredibly high fat. I love avocados. They're the best. I can, I can eat them all day. So good. Yeah. It's crazy because like I'll use the avocado oil dressing on top of an avocado, right? It's like uh -huh. this avocado. It's doubling on, up. Yeah. Avocado on avocado. So you can chew avocado and you can drink avocado. Yeah. Get it all in. You know, it's, uh, it's awesome to eat this way too because everything tastes so good. And I think like we just had, what did we just have? Coffee with ice cream in it? Yeah, <laughs> we got this keto ice cream from uh, Mammoth. They're a local local oh, uh, Mammoth, yeah, local place out here in Austin, and they're they're incredible. They're doing it right. Grass fed butter, free range eggs, uh, you know, low carb, hundred percent keto. Yeah, they really know high what's up. fat, heavy whipping cream. Yeah, yeah, and it's loaded with with high quality ingredients. That's the other thing we got to talk about here is like all these keto foods and snacks and things coming out, and it's like. You know, a lot of times I'm against a lot of that stuff because, you know, it promotes, usually promotes bad habits a lot of times. But on a keto diet, on the flip side, I've been sending my mom, like anytime a new keto thing comes out, I'll, I'll have the company send it to my mom because Mark and I know everybody through like Instagram and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I'll see like, oh, there's a new keto ice cream. There's a new keto cereal, you know, like, hey, mom, why don't you try this? Because I know my mom, she likes all the garbage, you know, so why not give her garbage replacement, you know, and it, and it works like the thing is like you'll you know for guys in their 30s i wouldn't recommend you going on a keto cheesecake diet but like look it's better than what my mom had been eating you know yeah. my mom's lost 38 pounds on keto already and she just started like you know when she had her back surgery a couple weeks ago and um just to to lose 38 pounds when you had back surgery like what's that going to mean for her you know um my mom said something to me that like we we did an interview 
with her and she's had a bad back for a long time. She's been on a walker for a long time. And Mark's daughter, Quinn, has her bedroom and it's upstairs. And I said to my mom, like, what's your dream in life? What do you want more than anything in life? She's like, I just want to walk up those stairs and see Quinn's bedroom. And to me, that's like, mm. it's heart wrenching. It's so yeah. sad that she can't walk up the stairs and see her granddaughter's bedroom. And it's like, I get choked up just even talking about it, right? And it's like, for me, that's the goal. Like, how do we get mom, you know, be, besides trying to like uh, <laughs> put her on her back and lift her up the stairs like Mark <laughs> and I would try to do, how do we get her up the stairs to see, you know, yeah. to see Quinn's bedroom? The way we do that is we get her to continue on the diet and we get her, we keep encouraging her and we keep giving her foods that she likes and we, we don't try to make it hard. Yeah, it doesn't have to taste like shit. It doesn't it really have to doesn't. be hard. Yeah. Yeah, it really doesn't. Yeah, and thankfully there's enough books out there with the right knowledge and and awesome films like like there's this a, one that's going to come out here. Yeah, there's a ton of books, a ton of information. It's everywhere now, you know, and that's what's nice about it. It's accessible now. Hell yeah. And a lot of good recipes too. It's oh, like man. some of these low carb uh, Instagram is like straight food porn. You know, and, and that's the thing I tell people is like, when you do this keto diet, I think you need to allow for stuff like that. And those become your cheats. Like, so it used, I used to do a keto diet and then do like straight cheats, but there's like no way I can eat flour anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no way I can eat vegetable oil. There's three things that are cut out of the diet. They're off the team for good. And you're off the team. Yeah it's, yeah. it's the vegetable and seed oils. It's the, the wheat products and the flours and it's the sugars. And those things are just, they just don't come in the diet anymore regardless of anything. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I, I just don't have them anymore. Yeah. I don't want them in my diet. I don't want them around. Uh, there's no good that can come out of those things. All the other carbs, I'm fine with having them once in a while, but not those, you know? Yeah. Agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, shit, brother. What else, uh, what else you got? You got anything else you want to add? I got <laughs> nothing, man. <laughs> we covered the whole gauntlet. Yeah, with the, the whole gauntlet. You know, my movie, A Leaf of Faith, comes out on Netflix on August 27th. I would really love for everybody to watch that and uh, give us some feedback on it. And also, uh, Natural Organics, with an X on the end, dot com is where people can, uh, if they want to order some Kratom, if they want to try it out. Um People can hit me up on Instagram at Big Strong Fast. If they have questions, like I said, a lot of people hit me up and ask me about, you know, addiction. And I can't answer every single question, but I try to get to as many of them as I can. So if you have questions about addiction or the diet or whatever, but also I, I encourage people to really read the posts because like, I, I'm sure you do this too. You go to town on a post and you write out everything that you could possibly explicitly write out. And somebody goes like, hey, bro, what do you eat? I'm like, yeah. I just talked about how I eat beef every meal for like the past <laughs> yeah. 80 posts. Yeah. And you're asking me what I eat? Like, yeah. come on. Look, like, look back through for a minute. So I'm saying it's that, like if you're on a forum and they're like, hey, read first, like in the FAQs on any forum, like read through some of the other posts first before posting a question because somebody's already asked that shit. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. If you're like, if you're late to the comments, then, you know, mm -hmm. go through a little bit first. Yeah. That's yeah. the advice I have. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, brother. It's been excellent having you, man. Awesome, man. Thanks, Kyle. Awesome, Chris.